Brazil. I know you all have a very, very long bio. I try to keep it short. Um, and uh, let's, uh, and Professor Dr. Michael Friebe, your friend and CEO of IDTM GMBA. Um, I'm going to do a longer introduction later. And uh, Ms. Anna Cristina Gallego Rosa, also Brazilian attorney. So um, I would like to start with uh, Professor Thais. She's going to give us an introduction about the physiology and psych psychology needed in, uh, to travel to space. Okay, can I, can I share my screen? Yes, please. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Very happy to be here discussing and presenting a bit about what uh, I know in terms of how humans um, adapt, uh, suffer, <laughs> and work in, uh, in space. So my, my idea is to give an overview of the human body in outer space. Is it changing these slides? Mm. Okay. So uh, let's go back in time, just very briefly. In 1961, Yuri Gagarin was the first man uh, that went uh, into space. Uh, by that time, space medicine was in, in its infancy. We didn't know anything about, who, in fact, what could happen to someone exposed to the microgravity of, his, of space and the radiation. Uh, so. I can I consider Gagarin a, a, really a hero in that sense because he really risked his life. There was no proper knowledge regarding medicine or space physiology. So here is a, bi a bit of, uh, let's say, the, the predicted effects of microgravity. And you can see that the confusion was um, really uh, very present at that time that some, uh, some consider that um, astronauts could have a urin urinary retention Others uh, increased urinary flow or hypertension or hypotension. So you can see that even uh, in this list, there, there are lots of contradiction. So the, the, the main aspects that we didn't know anything in 1961 when Gagarin went into space. So with time, things were basically changing. We learned a bit more through the uh, several uh, space programs I'm, uh, here. Uh, presenting the um, American space program, but of course the Europeans, the, nowadays the Chinese and the Japanese and so on, they also of course add lots of um, information for how humans uh, behave and respond to microgravity and radiation of space flights. But just for, you, for a, a very brief introduction in terms of historically, uh, based on the uh, American space program, you can see that the first three projects, Mer Mercury, Gemini and Apollo, we had a very low pressure in the spacecraft, which, which uh, then um, uh, uh, requires a, a high level of oxygen. So we have 100% oxygen and a very low pressure. Uh, during the Skylab uh, program, we decreased the pressure, uh, sorry, decreased the content of oxygen, but the pressure was still very low. So the idea that uh, humans had to adapt to all these very hostile uh, conditions was uh, was very present for the medical doctors and space uh, scientists. With the advent of a space shuttle and the, the ISS, the International Space Station, we could see a, a huge change in the, uh, let's say, the, um, uh, the environment. Uh, the engineers, the space engineers, were able to basically mimic, uh, simulate the Earth inside of a spacecraft or a space station. So pressure was basically at sea level, 760 millimeters of mercury. Oxygen is based what we had in our atmosphere, about 20%. The temperature was controlled. Uh, CO2 is not properly controlled yet. It is, it is um, uh, it in fact, is a, is a problem for the medical, uh, uh, you know, for, for some medical issues. But uh, in any case, we were able to mimic uh, much more nowadays, we are able to mimic much more nowadays the environment of Earth in space. So we are left with four main problems. <coughs> Microgravity, radiation, uh, aspects related to the, the mind of the astronauts in space, psychosocial problems, and the circadian rhythm. Uh, in terms uh, of the circadian rhythm, it happens because a spacecraft that's basically about 400 kilometers in altitude, is orbiting the Earth at a speed of 27,000 kilometers per hour. 
uh, this creates uh, a very short day uh, in terms of sunset and sunrise. We have 16 sunsets and sunrise in 24 hours, which disrupts the biological clock of astronauts. So these are the, they say, the four main issues that a space scientist, a physiologist, a medical doctor, a biologist, people that really study the human body in space have to be concerned about. If you go to Mars one day, we are going to have also to deal with uh, other issues. You now that is the hostile aspects of this uh, planet uh, in particular. So we have a very low temperature, uh, extremely low barometric pressure, a high concentration in the atmosphere of CO2. So it would create another, uh, let's say, challenge for humans uh, going to, to Mars. And also psychologically, we are going to see Earth as you can see Mars on the top uh, figure in this slide, which is just a dot in space, like you, know, you see from, uh, from, from here, you know, every night that you look at the sky and you see that small dot that's Mars over there, we are going to see Earth like that. And this might be very disruptive for the psychology of someone uh, observing uh, the Earth from Mars. So in terms, uh, uh, in general terms, what we know is that every single cell and every single uh, body system is affected by microgravity and radiation. So we have here a figure that shows a distribution of how the system somehow respond to, to the environment of space. So we have a, uh, the first one is the neurovestibular system that very quickly uh, respond with uh, a sense of disorientation. We have a shift from the uh, fluids and blood from our lower limbs and, and lower part of our body to the upper part of our body. We have a continuous uh, loss of, um, of uh, muscle and bones. We have the radiation continually affecting our body. But we believe that about a month in space, you, know, you, you get to another state of, uh, let's say, physiology, of, of how your body functions. Uh, not every single body uh, system adapts to microgravity, but uh, most of uh, the, let's say, the, the body reaches a kind of equilibrium after a month, a month and a half in space. So that's, that's more or less what is known. So let's start with the first change, the neurovestibular uh, change. It is basically um, an, an inability of our brain to understand what the eyes and the, the vestibular system, which is inside of our ear, tells us about our body orientation. So our vision says, for example, we are in the, we are upside down and our vestibular system that gives us you know, our balance, our coordination, our orientation says, no, you are not upside down. So this conflict of information creates uh, this disease, which is uh, expressed with lots of nausea, vomiting, lack of performance, a bit of headache. You know, it is very unpleasant. And it happens in general, in the first three days of a space flight, it's worse in the first day of uh, in the first uh, space flight. And uh, you have medications that can uh, minimize these uh, uh, signs and symptoms, but it also causes lots of other problems, which is a uh, lack of performance, uh, uh, sleepiness and uh, fatigue. So as I mentioned briefly, we have what's called the puffy face and bird leg syndrome when the blood this basically shifts from the lower body to the upper body, uh, making the, the face, uh, leaving the face a bit, let's say, rounded and a bit reddish, and the, the, the leg is very thin. So if you look at these uh, four men on the top, you know, the first one, the first uh, man is someone on Earth. If you go into space, the blood shifts to your chest and your head, and then it increases the heart, changes the pressures in your brain, your heart. Uh, with some time, uh, about a week or 10 days, you, you start adapting to that new state by losing the liquid part of your blood called plasma. So you can lose about 20% of your plasma and then your heart becomes smaller. You, you have a different dif uh, dis distribution of pressure and blood in your, in your body, but you are adapted to that. You, you become adapted to the space environment in terms of the microgravity effect. When you come back to Earth, that's the fourth uh, um, man there, you have a smaller heart, you have less blood, and then you have a, a difficulty, let's say, to stand up. It's called orthostatic, which is, is to stand up from sitting to st the standing position. You have a difficulty to stand up, so it's called orthostatic intolerance. You also have, um, you, you increase the height in space, so there is no gravity basically holding you at your 
uh, height, so you, you increase, you, you stretch a bit, could be up to six centimeters, and it can cause lots of back pain. You, are, you uh, assume a kind of semi-fetal position, like you can see the, the picture with the astronaut at the back with a pink shirt, you know, she, she's a bit, like say, in this semi-fetal position with the arms and, and the legs bent forward. So it is, uh, it's very, very difficult to stand up in microgravity. You need to, hold, to put your feet uh, somewhere, hold your feet somewhere to be able to do that. In terms of bones and muscles, this is really something that if you do not do anything, if you do not have to use any countermeasure, it will, you're going to lose lots of uh, bone mass and muscle mass during a space mission. With, with microgravity or, or the lack of gravity that you have here on Earth, especially the bones and the muscles of our lower limbs will, uh, and back will become very thin and very weak. Uh, here on Earth, is, if uh, uh, a woman is uh, in the post-menopausal uh, phase, uh, she loses about uh, 1% of bone mass a year, and astronauts can lose about 1% a month. And if you can look at this figure, you can see that the, the, the heel bones even uh, could lose uh, about 2%. So it's a lot of uh, uh, bone and muscle uh, loss. Uh, of course, it, it depends on the duration of exposure. And uh, if, you, if you perform exercise, it can save you a bit. Uh, in the, it can protect uh, it, it, the loss of bone mass and, uh, and um, muscle mass. Diet is very important, especially for the replacement of calcium and, um, of course, exposure, exposure to the vitamin to the sun, which is not possible in space. Therefore, supplements of vitamin D should be taken. And uh, there are uh, several uh, aspects related to the person it's, uh, himself or herself that is related to the individual variability. So what you have to do in space, it's about two to two, two and a half hours of exercise per day with different equipments that are adapted to microgravity. So the first one is a res resistive exercise that uh, is replace the weights here on Earth. Since we don't have gravity, there is no weight, so you cannot, uh, you have to replace that by a resistance exercise. Locomotion, it's in the resistance uh, aerobic fitness you can get to uh, treadmills and uh, cycle ergometers. The mind in space is a huge area, it's very complex. You know, psych space psychology, psychiatry is uh, specifically a huge area. You have to deal with isolation, monotony. People complain that after months and months in space becomes very monotonous, very uh, stressing because uh, you are away from your families, you are confined, you are, you are isolated from all your references and uh, you know, your daily life. So it's, it sometimes is difficult for the astronauts, although they, although they are pre-selected and they are very motivated and they are uh, very goal-oriented, intelligent people. Uh, sometimes they suffer a lot. Some have developed depression during the missions. There are uh, uh, radiation effects to our brains that might affect cognition and some uh, behavioral um, aspects of uh, during the space mission. Nowadays, we are going a bit deeper, no, not just the, the body systems are being studied, but also some more, uh, more let's say, specific aspects like genetics. The, very recently, there was this flight of uh, uh, twins, no, uh, astronaut twins. One stayed here on Earth and one went into space and several uh, comparisons in terms of um, uh, their response, their, their, the difference in their response of after a year in space was uh, then uh, um, evaluated. And of course, if they are genetically equal, so you avoid a huge bias in the results of your studies. Even the microbiota of the astronauts nowadays are studied because we know that microgravity radiation can uh, by, its, by themselves affect the microbiota, which is completely related to the immune system and so on. So it is uh, something that is, my, my point here is that it's not just the big systems that you are studying, you are going deeper and deeper and trying to basically understand all the effects of microgravity and radiation on human bodies. Um, so what we do nowadays, we have medical training for astronauts, not every single flight we have, there is a, a doctor on board. So you need, they need to be trained uh, to identify some signs and symptoms, perform some uh, minor surgeries if needed, uh, and also collect data to be transmitted to Earth so they can 
uh, has received some teleconsultation, telehealth from the ground. So here is a, a good example of telemedicine. The, uh, the astronaut collects the data uh, on, uh, uh, during the flight and transmit to the, to the doctors here on Earth so they can basically evaluate the changes that, that are happening in microgravity, so the physiological changes. They can uh, uh, evaluate some clinical aspects of the astronauts during a mission, and they can also interfere immediately if there is a uh, emergency. So the first, uh, uh, what, uh, what is important to understand is that telemedicine or telehealth the, did not start with the space flight. So back in 1906, uh, the I, Eindhoven, that was the inventor of the ECG, transmitted the first ECG here on Earth from a distance. So tele, telehealth started much before uh, Gagai went into space, but by completely by uh, by coincidence, or it's, uh, at least it's an interesting curiosity, the, um, uh, the first exam transmitted from space was also a tele, uh, uh, it was also an ECG. Uh, if you are in orbit, in low Earth orbit, this communication is in real time, so whatever, what, uh, if you transmit any medical data, it's going to be a, uh, it's in, in real time transmission, so you can have a, a teleconsultants <coughs> that will be very efficient to, uh, uh, to an astronaut, although if you go to Mars and then we are going to have a huge issue there, which is the distance between the two planets. Uh, remember that I mentioned all the problems related to the to space flight, microgravity and radiation, then you are going to have the hypogravity of Mars and the, and the hostile environment or environment of Mars that you have to deal with. And you are there, you know, less, let's say, with uh, your health is not uh, at, your, at, at the best, and you, and you cannot communicate with Earth uh, in the same way that you do when you are in Earth's orbit, because there is no way to do that. The, the, the real-time communication is gone, and you have a delay that ranges from four minutes to uh, uh, up to 20, 22 minutes. So it's a long, uh, uh, long um, uh, delay if you are with a medical situation of emergency. So solutions for that, you no. Know, one thing that astronauts are doing nowadays is they are, uh, they can develop or construct or build some um, uh, medical tools in space by printing them, not just medical, but also um, for your tooth, for, your, uh, for the care of your teeth. So it is, a, it is a, a, a situation that was impossible in the past, but with the uh, 3D printer nowadays, it's a possibility. As I mentioned, the astronaut training is extremely important. It has to be adapted to the different missions, either uh, because of the time, the duration of the mission, could it be a short mission, a long-term mission, or if you are going to stay in, in Earth, lower, uh, in the low Earth's orbit, or if you're going to the Moon or Mars, everything has to be adapted. So astronauts have to uh, uh, be trained for that. Uh, we are going to be relying on uh, robots. You no, know, that's the main point or idea is that when you are in, on Mars one day, uh, you are going to need to have uh, artificial intelligence, extremely um, sophisticated algorithms that could, uh, let's say, uh, help astronauts in terms of uh, medical uh, emergence or clinical situations that could happen when you are there. Because as I said, telemedicine per se, in terms of teleconsultation, will be affected by the distance between the two planets and the way that communication can be established. So robots will be very useful for uh, diagnose and uh, uh, the first, let's say, management treatment uh, advice of what to do or ho how to do, and even to perform surgery in space. Uh, that's the, the, the main idea. With the advance of the space tourism, you are going to have more recreational, leisure, and business type of uh, space flight. And it will create, it, it will add to the, to the work of space, uh, space doctors, space physiologists, uh, a lot, um, uh, several challenges because people will be less fit, the candidates should, will be less fit to, to, to face a space flight. Uh, sometimes maybe they will be sick or under some type of medication or treatment. They will be older than the normal uh, population. And here you can see, for example, Steve Hawking that uh, suffered from um, degenerative disease, uh, motor disease, very, he had, um, uh, he couldn't uh, speak or move or, uh, and uh, he was in microgravity. So 
uh, in a parabolic flight. It's not a space mission, it's a parabolic flight, but we can see that maybe if you are famous or have money, you would be, you buy your way into space, which is a very, very different approach than we have nowadays when you select and train astronauts. There is this uh, big change from the past, uh, let's say the first, I would say that's the second big change because first we had a very fit young man from the military because that were the, let's say the, the, the core of the astronauts, by it, it's in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, by 80s and 90s, you have a change from this uh, very, let's say, fit uh, um, humans or individuals to more, let's say, scientists. So the scientists were less, um, uh, as I said, less fit, but also uh, older. Uh, they had more capability of performing experiments and, um, and uh, understand or, or improve humans' uh, uh, life and work in space, but they were less, um, let's say, capable of uh, you know, performing uh, aerobically, let's say, in comparison to the military. And now we're going to have a second change to be people that are older, less fit, to go into space as tourists. So this is a very you know, general overview that I wanted to give from what happens to the, the human um, body and mind in microgravity uh, with radiation as well. And if you go to Mars, all the issues that we're going to uh, face and how we can uh, somehow try to prevent with uh, uh, countermeasures during the flight and the support of medical uh, teleconsultation and telehealth from, from the ground. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Professor Thais, for giving us an overlook about uh, space, the physiology and psychology needed in space. Uh, I know there are a few questions. Uh, we're going to run those questions to our speakers uh, after the other two presented. So um, thank you so much, Professor. Um, the second speaker we have today is another long introduction. It's Miss Ana Cristina Galeco Rosa. She's a Brazilian lawyer specialized in air and space law, telecommunication, international trade law, and ins uh, insurance. She's also the founder and CEO of Dipteron and uh, ISU alumni from 2014, Christina, yes? Uh, she's going to uh, share with us uh, about space application for global health and uh, is going to demonstrate uh, her own startup after she visited the International Space University. Uh, she did her own startup, which uh, helps benefits uh, humans on Earth here. So go ahead and uh, share your space for health, Anna. I'm going to unmute you. Hello? Yes. Yes. Can you see my screens? Yes. My screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, hi. Thank you very much for, again, this opportunity to share with you all this uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, community. Now uh, we are together to share our knowledge uh, and our opinions and our, our passion. <laughs> okay. Uh, my, I just, uh, I'm going to do a very uh, short presentation, but focus in my, a little, a little in my application and um, that I would like to just to give an, uh, a very short overview that uh, some mentions what, which kind of space applications that we can use it for, for health. So we can use it for the satellite communication, for also the meteorological and the remote sensing uh, satellites. Né? This uh, application promotes né, the, the use of uh, spatial analysis to identify, né, uh, as I, I wrote, the ecological, the environmental, climatic, climatic and other factor that can have a negative effect on public health or can contribute 
to the spread of diseases. So, and, and this, uh, um, the, the Space for Health has been uh, discussed uh, in 2000, starting in 2000, uh, 2015 with an uh, expert group on space and global health uh, in um, one, the subcommittee, uh, the scientific technical subcommittee of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space uh, in Vienna. And now uh, in 2018, this uh, became also uh, an, uh, I integrated uh, the agenda item to discuss in this uh, scientific uh, uh, and technical subcommittee of COPUS. And in 2018, at the UN, UN, Unispace uh, Plus 50, uh, also, um, the Space for Health uh, was very uh, uh, stressed uh, for, for the space cooperation. So I just, again, so just give you a, a little visualization for the Earth observation satellites, satellites that, as I mentioned uh, previously, so we can uh, use it for epidemiology of uh, infectious diseases. So the, the application has been used for uh, malaria, uh, for dengue, for another virus, and for the application for telecommunications uh, satellites uh, uh, that also uh, my colleague previous mentioned about the telemedicine that is this application uh, uh, enable uh, the sharing of health and uh, medical expertise. And uh, we have also the meteorological satellites that can uh, give uh, uh, a disaster management, né? Uh, give it a, a climate prediction. So with this, you can also manage uh, coming disaster. Uh, uh, the United Nations has a specific office for this, this uh, Winnie Spider, uh, who also uh, deal with the disaster management. But I forgot uh, one uh, very now application that uh, is uh, being used uh, for the COVID-19, this is uh, the Global Navigation Satellite System, the GNS that track the movement of uh, people. So with this, they can uh, get, get a prediction or where uh, the, the virus can um, uh, spread uh, this. So I just forgot to mention now <laughs> about this application as well. So in terms for, for me to give an example, I'm going to, I go to for the remote sense uh, application that uh, I use it uh, in my uh, application uh, in 2000, as I mentioned also high, uh, I attended the space study, space study program in 2014. Uh, and then I attended the business, the business department. And then I realized that I, I could do a, uh, a business with a, on a space application, but not for this. And where I went to my home country in 2015 after uh, the, uh, the, and then there was a, a lot of problem in Brazil with uh, the, uh, dengue, Zika, chikungunya. For, for me, this scenario shocked me. And then I, who, what I could help, this was my first idea because of oh, space applications. So I contact a lot of experts, try to, to read, but, and then I it started. And it's a challenge, but almost there. <laughs> so my deep throw now uh, incubated at the European Space Agency. Uh, we also has, uh, we won three competitions. Uh, recently, now we are in the Parsec Accelerated Program, and now next week I'm going also to pitch for, for the Open Call 2. And uh, for this, uh, 
uh, return in the beginning what uh, I, I mentioned there yeah, because of uh, the first idea because I was in Brazil but the, the major problem is because the AIDS mosquito uh, uh, transmitted dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. Yeah. It is a situation very, a very, very tragic because uh, more than 50 million of people are infected per year. And 40% and it represent 40% of the diseases on the planet. It's quite a lot. And uh, vaccine has uh, under development, not 100% uh, in a, a good way. And, uh, but the most problem is that the, the economy bur burden the, in countries is very high. Well, for instance, only in Brazil last, last year, we spent 500, uh, millions of dollars only in the for the dengue management and uh, but totally globally is more than perhaps now 20 billion dollars in because this uh, uh, disease affected 148 countries globally so for my solution i how uh, we the application works Be besides we we have uh, using the remote and sense application uh, um, we have also the artificial intelligence together so basically uh, mosquito uh, um, um, depends on climate and environment conditions if we detect this um, uh, 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 his um, behavior, his uh, temperature, so we can uh, try to, to track, no, no, to, to, to know the areas. So we use uh, um, climate also observation data uh, and another uh, relevant data as biological data and uh, demographic information. These are ground, ground information from the um, health uh, department from the, uh, the country that I, I will uh, try all go to put the application. With this, with all this data, they are uh, trained and tested in this, this um, in artificial intelligence system and give us a prediction model for X in advance. So uh, basically uh, decision makers can uh, be aware in, in four weeks that areas, uh, uh, in areas that the, the map can, can show. Uh, this is one example. Uh, I train, uh, Diptron already trained uh, the Sao Paulo city, uh, the, Brazilian, uh, uh, the Brazilian city Sao Paulo uh, with this example that uh, the application gives us a, a risk map of the area. So with this, uh, decision makers, uh, they can take uh, the actions, yeah? uh, not take actions after happen everything. They can mitigate before happen. So basically for the application, we go uh, for the government and no governmental customers. We offer, yeah, as I uh, early warning system for IADS outbreaks that can uh, give, um, uh, we, the government decision makers, they are going to have uh, mitigation actions. E, uh, the application, uh, the services, that uh, can uh, give the localization of the outbreaks, uh, give the visualization also the potential breed sites and the number of cases in uh, each areas. Uh, at the present, uh, Diptron it, uh, has a, already a strategic partner that uh, in Brazil. Why Brazil? Because Brazil is my, my first market. No, okay, I'm originally from Brazil as well. And uh, we are now uh, with a pilot uh, for the Brazilian city in San Jose dos Campos that is going to start to run. So basically, 
I just want to summarize uh, a little the benefits for uh, use Earth observation satellite and for the benefits uh, with my application. So uh, the Earth observation can uh, give you um, uh, timely information in wide areas and uh, uh, can, the, the satellites can, can, they can do the uh, spatial analysis of the uh, potential British sites, helps to identify areas uh, prone to the appearance of the spread of uh, the epidemics, and can also moni moni monitoring and update the environment parameters. Yes, this, and it give it also uh, the logistical uh, management for operations and can update the mathematical model. But Diptron, the, uh, the application besides using Earth observation has a plus together with the, the artificial intelligence that also can, besides the Earth observation, uh, the application uh, give uh, the accuracy, the accuracy of the result is, is higher than only use uh, GIS. We have also uh, a much higher than the, the knowledge result. And uh, if you, uh, if, it, if the application, if you mitigate before, uh, go to the areas uh, and uh, do mitigations actions like fumigation, all the area or um, uh, investigate uh, the, the population that the area, give it information, try to educate it. So it's a, a lot of actions together that can also uh, uh, prevent the outbreak. So, and also the most important that the application, né, uh, with this, the, the government for sure is going to save money uh, decrease the cost of the economy bur burden of uh, in, in in the health uh, field, and because in the, the most important also that the application if uh, you they they know the areas that uh, can in uh, high high uh, risky areas uh, problems they can also save lives by, minim by minimizing the risk of these diseases because uh, they also uh, dengue can be uh, a fatal disease if uh, the uh, person can get the uh, dengue, uh, hemorrhagic dengue. That also uh, quite uh, some uh, deaths, I think I believe last year was uh, 20,000 uh, 20, uh, people uh, dying with hemorrhagic dengue. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for uh, presenting the benefits of for space for health to us via your own impressive journey that I've witnessed from day one <laughs> to from the uh, idea to the execution of uh, this uh, startup you you are working on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is one second is Professor Dr. Michael Friebe. He's a CEO of IDTM GmbH. Michael is a German citizen with the expertise in diagnostic imaging, image-guided therapies. Uh, he's, he's known as the health Democra democratize enabler. He's a founder, innovator, CEO, father, investor, research scientist. Uh, he's got a bachelor in e electrical engineering uh, PhD in medical physics and is currently a research fellow at TUM in Munich and adjunct professor at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane and a professor at the medical faculty uh, in Germany in Mag Magdeburg. He's an inventor of over 100 patent applications and a distinguished lecturer of EMBS teaching innovation and he's going to present to us today space health issues from the perspective of an earth-based health innovation. The floor is all yours, Michael. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ian, for the introduction. So can we share content? Not share. yet. We share. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I try to, but I don't have the, there's another applicant who okay. still yeah, has it, so. Do you want to share your, uh, stop your sh screen sharing, then Michael can.
Yes. So let's try so screen. I'll just try that on the on the iPad. So you should see now my keynote presentation. Is that right? Do you see it? Yes. Very good. So let's get started. Um, he already introduced, I'm an engineer. I'm, I, I have not had too much uh, experience to, to the space yet, but I'll show you some pictures anyway later on. And um, what I would like to talk about is what are the similarities between space issues on Earth and, and probably space issues in space, uh, sorry, health issues in space. And I, I, you will see, I hope at least you will see that there is some commonalities and there is some some similarities and there's something we can learn from um, where health is moving in uh, on earth for the benefit of uh, space issues uh, health uh, health related space issues so um, let me start with showing you something here so this is my sister and me and you have seen the picture already on on go zero uh, with Stephen Hawking I'm obviously not Stephen Hawking but if you look on the on the right picture you see me in the back I'll start the video here pretty quickly it's also loud so I'm floating around. It's a lot of fun. So um, I can always advise if anybody wants to do that and get a little bit of a space experience, go book a flight with, uh, with that plane. It's, it's awesome. So what do healthcare uh, and space, healthcare and earth and space have in common? Well, first of all, they are a combination of many technologies, not electrical engineering only. It's, uh, it's AI, as we just heard from the previous uh, presentation. It's uh, also mechanical engineering. There are sensor-based uh, uh, topics in there. Uh, there's communication issues involved. There's all kinds of, of other things that make um, healthcare or health tech uh, quite complicated. Uh, typically, they take a very long time for development. Actually, the development time is not that long, but the translation time is long. So it takes a long time before things are actually accepted as um, a valuable tool. And um, obviously, uh, it's quite expensive um, to get it implemented and uh, takes a long time. Um, and uh, sometimes for, for startup companies, it's very difficult to achieve. Uh, typically, um, healthcare is extremely conservative and very nimble. If people don't know exactly what nimble is, it's the opposite of agile. And the reason for that is obviously because life depends on it. So if you have a, the wrong uh, healthcare device or it gives the wrong information, you know, which leads to a wrong treatment, you could actually die from that. And the same thing goes for, for applications or for general the space. Uh, if you do something wrong uh, with the rocket design, with the, with the spaceship design, with, with anything that happens up there, people die. So uh, uh, conservatism is, is sometimes not bad but it also uh, has as a disadvantage that it takes forever to get things implemented. And if you really look at, at uh, space technology right now, there is not a lot of the very latest technology in Earth involved because it's not considered proven yet. So they have a high impact, both of them. So everything you invest in, in healthcare has a very high potential um, of benefiting humanity, benefiting everyone, and creating a lot of... Um, lot of uh, problem solutions and the same thing could happen with respect to uh, to space if you invest in space um, and one of the examples we have heard that was quite interesting is the the whole telehealth approach uh, you know it obviously was developed because there was no doctor in space and uh, the technology helped communicating um, uh, health issues in space to the earth um, with all the latency issues and everything uh, that is that is uh, uh, around that but uh, telehealth has now with COVID-19 gotten a huge boost. The technology was around for a long time, but it has not, it was actually not adapted, not uh, accepted uh, by the relatively nimble and conservative systems and also by the paternalistic approach of the, uh, of the doctors that are uh, dealing with these issues. So um, we are not really talking about democratization in health. So in, in places like in the US or Germany, we have uh, fairly advanced systems. We do actually quite well, we complain anyway, but if we really com compare ourselves to areas in Africa, uh, we are way better off. But the question is really on whether that is something that benefits us dramatically or helps us dramatically. If you look at life expectancy, it probably doesn't that much, you know, considering how much money we invest in it. And uh, the reason for that is that we invest a lot of time 
into in developing incremental innovations rather than actually being very disruptive. And space is obviously also not democratized. I mean, even if you look from the travel point of view and even if, and the, the initial picture you saw with me in the, uh, in the uh, zero gravity flight, this is a $5,000 flight. Now, probably pretty much everybody on this call will be able to afford it if they really want to, but it still is quite expensive. So it's, it's far off from being democratized. So, I believe that a lot of the expansion of technology and also the agile innovation uh, approaches that we are dealing with and that we're talking about uh, will possibly help to create further disruptions in that space uh, and make both healthcare delivery and space uh, potentially more uh, available and affordable. And um, both, I have to say, health and space come with a huge personal satisfaction. I'm actually doing something for space, with space, and maybe even for you being in space, it's, uh, that's a really, really cool uh, thought. And uh, also helping people, um, you know, dealing with their health issues or maybe even preventing them from getting sick is a, is a huge personal satisfaction. So developed world is just, just go very quickly through this, but I, I want to highlight a couple of things. Currently, we are actually focusing on diagnosing and treatment sick. We have high regulatory burdens. I've mentioned all of this before. And we need to have, and that's something that is space relevant, we need to more focus on prevention. So actually not uh, dealing when you're sick, but preventing you from getting sick. And that's why we need to have a, a complete delivery shift in the future in the healthcare on earth. Uh, and with that come different business models and innovation models. I'll, I'll go over this very quick. So there's a quadruple aim on earth. Uh, we need to have uh, better outcomes. Obviously, we don't want to have healthcare that is worse than before, and we need to have uh, improved clinical and patient experiences. And what's most important is we need to dramatically reduce the cost of healthcare delivery. Now, this last part is very relevant to space. Even though people always think space, uh, there's plenty of money available and can't be expensive enough. Interesting enough, lower cost requires lower complexity. It also requires lower sizes. Um, simpler designs and typically also comes with much smaller and more lightweight devices uh, that are then a lot cheaper that uh, can be shared with everybody on earth and that is something that is very relevant for space you need to have something that is fairly easy to use is um, uh, reproducible is robust um, lightweight and if it shouldn't work anymore you just get another one or maybe you even have another one up there maybe you can print it on board you can actually create it yourself it goes wrong now with all the complex devices um, all the expensive devices you can't do these kind of things so this is very relevant for space now um I, I, I jump over this one, I'll just throw it up. So there's a lot of things happening in the world in healthcare that has nothing to really do with uh, space. But uh, what I wanted to show with this uh, ch uh, chart is that there will be traumatic changes in healthcare coming up on earth. And again, they will have an effect for any of the um, innovations that we may be able to create for space. So uh, there's a lot of innovation potentials with that. I don't want to go through them in, in detail, um, but please look at them uh, if, you, if you create innovation. If you also create when the last, uh, uh, the last presentation was very interesting with the respect to uh, uh, global tracing uh, and, and a certain tracing apps and COVID-19 is one, is one of those issues at the moment that can be controlled and can be uh, done uh, technologically from space. So there's, there's interesting applications. I'm not necessarily sure that the telehealth approach with satellites will be the future, but a lot of the things that we do here um, uh, with respect to health have a huge uh, uh, innovation opportunity also for space applications. So a little bit going to the space travel. I think some of the things were mentioned already and I don't, don't want to claim to be an, an health expert by any means, I'm an engineer, but I want to get to the point that we should analyze the problems carefully. And if we analyze the problems carefully, we can actually uh, come up with interesting solutions or interesting ideas at least. So typically uh, when you do healthcare and space travel, that doesn't go for these zero G flights and maybe for the short term flights, there's a, there's a, you're dealing with healthy people. There's a, there's a, so, so what you should do is you should clearly do a pre-check and what's very important, and please note that and, 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 and mark that you need to have a status. So what is your current status? What are your current parameters? Because what's the most important thing is in, the, in, in traveling in space is actually checking on whether your, your uh, status, your parameter deviates from 
what it was on earth and how we deviate and, and what maybe we can learn from the deviation with respect to giving treatments or um, uh, medication or whatever. So um, most important thing is you need to stay healthy when you go uh, in, 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 uh, in space. And uh, that's again why you need to have this, uh, this checkup beforehand. And it does not need to be that you are 100% healthy or that you are 100% above a threshold. You just need to know where, what is my personal, what are my personal parameters set and how do I deviate if I, if I leave my normal uh, earthbound environment. So um, travel times, um, I, I, I think if we, for everything for short-term flights and for um, maybe even going to the, to the moon, we're talking about relatively short travel time. So the only thing you need to uh, be able to do from a health perspective, and, and we have seen some, uh, some very nice slides from the first presentation, is to monitor, analyze, and predict. And if we find deviations, we, we should actually come up with some easy remedies. And most of the remedies uh, are probably related to food, the digestion, the cardiac, I, 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 I underscore digestion. And I think we, we saw it in the first presentation too. There's a lot of things that happen in your digestive system and this, and you basically your, your excrements. So what comes out of the, uh, at, at the bottom, that is an incredibly important information and can be measured. So basically your, I think that Peter Diamond is always says it poopables. So whatever you can analyze from your stool, from your, from your poops, that is incredibly important to uh, give information back to what your intake should be and how you can compensate for any deficiencies. Obviously, there's, there, there could be some mental health issues, but I'm not sure that that is a, really a, an issue with short-term travel. So question should be, or I, I have to ask you, maybe that's something that um, I would stimulate you to come up with, what else can happen? And uh, that was a radiation issue. Radiation is something you cannot necessarily deal with completely. You can. Uh, create some measures around the, the spaceship, you know, some, some anti-gravitation fields or some anti-magnetic or some, some, some counter-magnetic fields. Uh, but what is the likelihood, and that's, that's what we do on Earth as well when we analyze uh, health problems, what is the likelihood of certain things happening and the severity of certain things happening? So um, I think when you go to Mars, it may be a different story. You should need to stay healthy and fit. And uh, we have also seen that in the first slides. So I believe that the clinical experts you will have on board on a space, it will be not human-based, it will be sensor and AI-based. And this is also something that you can bring back again to, uh, to Earth because we have a lot of areas where there is not enough doctors in it. So anyway, so it's the same, uh, the same application on Earth that we could uh, mirror to the, uh, sorry, same application space that we can mirror to Earth. So, um, anything I just mentioned, anything outside these easy remedies will probably be very difficult, uh, maybe even impossible to do the latencies that we have and maybe do the complexities. So I have one quick example for you. This is a device I actually uh, designed in my own lab and it's called an auscultation device. Auscultation is something basically you're listening to the inside of the body. Um, and you cannot only, it's, it's like, it's not a digital stethoscope. Obviously people say it's a stethoscope, it's not. What you do is you can actually measure flow profiles. You can see stenosis. You can maybe even listen to uh, uh, valve functions. You could use it as a, as a coughing device where you actually see what the lung functions are. You can analyze you're swallowing, etc. So if you use this and um, maybe uh, extract information based on the audio profile, you could actually um, create a device that uh, that is you know connected to AI systems, and is incredibly cheap. And it's something you can do. You, you can print with a 3D printer. It's, it's, it's very small, uh, fully connected, and creates informa an information-based con uh, co uh, co combination with the deep learning that probably gives information about your status uh, and about deviations from your status. So it, this is a quick video well, here uh, where I show. So this is just so a prototype. The device. And I think we, we may not actually go through this in, in depth, but uh, so we just connect it very quickly um, to a local device or a smartphone, uh, for example. And then um, what we, uh, the what way, we then do is we place it on a, this is a development engineer. So we place it on, uh, on the carotid artery. Uh, a button to um, actually connect to the system. Wait a little bit. So it's connected now. And, and now you see a little bit the signal in the background. The, uh, when you connect it to the, to the carotid artery, you then see signals that uh, when you do a, a proper analysis, um, 
you see the ECG and signal, that's not the important thing. The up. background is the important thing. And again, whatever you can do the... um, to use external sensors, not internal sensors, could be quite helpful to uh, future health yeah. issues. So I, I, I just copied these, uh, these things from the first presentation because I wanted to cover some of the things. I hope I did. Uh, microgravitation, I cannot really do anything about, but I'm, I was very interested to see. Radiation is something you, you have to deal with. Uh, there was a question in the, in the chat that radiation is causing cancer. Yes, it is. Uh, it's, it's statistics. Um, so if you're exposed to radiation for a longer period of time, you will actually get, you will have a higher chance of getting it. Um, and, and those are the issues that we need to have to actually create innovations. So I had a very interesting talk with uh, Dori Donoville. I don't know if, if she's known here, but um, I, I was talking with her about um, about creating actually a surgery room on in space for for a space tube, and, and she said that basically NASA has given up on these in-flight surgery types. So they basically have to hope that nothing happens. I said that before severity and likelihood that something happens, and uh, there's lots of issues why that doesn't work. Now, when you have a a Martian station, you probably have a surgery room, but probably for the trip to and from it probably will not happen. You just may have to deal with this chance that this uh, is a problem. So in general, what we do in, on Earth is that we actually analyze problems very clearly by having an empathetic approach to the problem. Then we define uh, initial solutions. We try to actually come up with more ideas, create prototypes and test them. And the same thing we should do uh, in, in help and I hope you can actually help us uh, describe the problem better. And then I'm uh, quite capable and others too to actually provide initial solutions and then be able to test them. And with that, um, thank you very much for your attention and I uh, hope it was somewhat entertaining. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for sharing your space health issues from the perspective as a health tech innovator. <laughs> Anytime I speak to you, it's really inspiring to uh, learn more about innovation. Um, I know we have a few questions. Uh, Alicia, do you wanna uh, read the questions? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for your fantastic presentations. We have two ph physiological questions and one question regarding psychology. So actually both uh, Professor Friebe and Professor Rosomano talked about diet and the fact that uh, what the astronauts eat is important and the digestive system and how it changes in space. So one of our questions is from Barbara, who was wondering, would being vegan, would being a vegetarian, would changing the diet of an astronaut help the astronaut while they are in space? I live in I'm not. I'm. Yeah. I'm. I'm not a doctor, so I. Can, I cannot really comment on it. I. I, I personally would not want to live uh, vegetarian, but that's my personal opinion. So. Um, so the, the the question is if it, if uh, someone that is vegan or vegetarian would suffer more or less in space. Is that the question? Yeah. Is it is it better? It would be. Would it be useful to be vegan or vegetarian as an astronaut? Does it? Would it help considering uh, a different kind of diet for astronauts? Well, you know, it's a very interesting question, in fact. Uh, nutrition is for sure a very important aspect of a space mission. And what we know by now is that astronauts, they eat less calories a day than they should. Uh, it's uh, what's prescribed, but it's not, uh, in fact, uh, followed. So, uh, and food evolved a lot from the first uh, missions. You now we had, let, I don't know if people remember, but like, it was like a kind of toothpaste <laughs> that they would... Uh, uh, try to eat in space, so it was not very pleasant, and um, it shifted now to a much better, let's say, type of uh, uh, menu, and uh, they even have fresh food in the first days of a space mission, and so on. Uh, I'm not, I'm not familiar with any study that compared vegetarians, uh, vegetarian as an uh, vegetarian astronaut with someone that's not vegetarian, for example. Uh, I don't think that it, that would be a huge issue if you go into space and, and keep, uh, try to keep your uh, diet. Uh, the most important aspects that the diet brings enough uh, nutrients to, your, uh, to keep you healthy in space, uh, not necessarily meat is, necess is needed uh, for, let's say, vegetarians and, um, and all dairy products in relation to the, to the vegan ones. Uh, it would be interesting to, of course, to have a better uh, a longitudinal study 
uh, having the astronauts uh, with vegetarian diet, vegan diet, and uh, let's say more let's say com complete diet or without any restrictions. Uh, I, I don't see that it would affect. What is, um, what is important though, is that it is, uh, as I mentioned very briefly in my explanation, in my presentation, is that the microbiota of the intestines of the astronauts, they change in space. And this is not related to the diet. Well, it is a bit of the diet, of course, because the diet change in the space, but it is also related, it's believed to be related also to the microgravity effect and the radiation effect of a space mission. And this can impact the, uh, the other functions or the important functions of the human uh, body, like uh, in the immune system, for example. As a, nutrition, uh, as a nutritionist and exercise physiologist, uh, two things you don't want to lose, right? In space, that's lean mass and uh, uh, your immune system, your general immune system. So it is known that the immune system decreasing microgravity. Uh, the uh, microgravity, uh, in fact, I have done a study simulating microgravity on Earth uh, for, for immune cells. And um, immune cells, is, they are not stressed. You can say, oh, you, are, you have a, a lower immune system because you are stressed in the space. Uh, but in this case, it's just cells. So cells are not stressed. They are uh, responding to this simulated microgravity. And they, after 24 hours in a microgravity simulation, the immune cells decrease their proliferation. And it is seen, it is seen in the space. You know? it, uh, apparently, it does not in, increase the risk for um, immune-related diseases, like even infections, although there are cases, reported cases of um, infections in space, skin infections, gastrointestinal gas infections, uh, cold, but it is, it's not common. It's, um, it's uh, quite kind of rare somehow. Thank you very much for this complete answer. Uh, another question, when you talked about the change of the kind of astronauts that were going to go up with space tourism, and because this is the Space for Women show, uh, one question that comes to mind uh, linked to uh, the news lately with the um, appointment of a um, woman director of human spaceflight at NASA and the declaration that a woman, uh, she would be in charge of bringing the first woman on the moon, the first woman on Mars. Uh, what do you think all of your uh, all of the panelists about potentially the physiological benefits of sending a woman rather than a man on a space mission. This for me as well? Or, or yeah, you can start. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a, it's a very interesting question because if you look at the, the number of astronauts that we have now, is about 570, 508 astronauts, and only 11% are female astronauts. So when we talk about um, a human space flight uh, uh, data in terms of the human physiology in space or psychology in space. In fact, we are talking about uh, male data. And um, even in, in ground-based studies here on Earth, and I, I know that because I've been working with that for a long, long, long time, and 95% uh, of these studies, uh, they are based on male subjects. So I, in fact, I was the one, or at least I was one of the scientists that uh, really uh, uh, compared, let's say, we, in my studies, I always try to compare genders, you know, to have a group of male and a group of male subjects. Uh, but it's not the, if you look at the literature, that's not the, the, the main approach. So I believe that the, it will be important to send a woman into space or, or uh, sorry, to, to, to the moon and uh, one day to, to Mars as well, because uh, this is what is about, you know, it's human, uh, somehow exploration is not just male exploration of space and if one day you want to have colonies and so on you need to have couples you need to reproduce in space and so women will become an important aspect of that so i think that it is um, uh, it's not uh, there is no um, there are some differences i cannot say that's not the case you no know, the immune system is different of males and females the way that uh, women deal with stress or 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 even uh, some cardiovascular aspects of a uh, space flight and when they are back, they are different, but it doesn't matter if they are different. We need to study, understand, and create ways for both men and women to be uh, capable of exploring space. 
Thank you for that answer. Um, Professor Fibe, uh, Anna Christina. Yeah, let me add any... a, yeah, yeah, let me add a couple of things. Again, I'm not a doctor, so I, 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 I'm going more like as a common sense person on the whole thing. I'm married for 26 years, so I, I, I could not live without my wife and without a wife. And I believe that um, I think women bring in a completely different character aspect. And, and if we talk about a team flight and it's not going to be a woman that flies alone right to mars there will be a team aspect to that i think it is it's, it is incredibly helpful to have not only different ages and uh, uh, but also different sexes on board now uh, i i with ties what you just said was it there's a very important aspect to that too is is like when we talk and i, I, I want to rephrase of what i said i believe that sensors and ai will be the doctor so we can go into health and ai has a has a huge bias typically to the to the input parameters that you do and we need to make sure that the input parameters are also based on on women data because it is a different data set and it it, it is different uh it, with respect to what the ai actually comes up with and the deep learning comes up with and we need to really really be certain that we don't create any bias in the data sets so that we, if, if it's used for, uh, for space application and for other applications too, is that we really use a, a data set that is basically representative of the, of the Earth population. Otherwise, it would not really work well. So I, 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 I generally believe that uh, males by itself, and, and, and if you have, you are actually not males, but if I deal with my uh, peers and, and there's too many too many of these alpha animals around it's a huge problem so uh, women always have actually created a a, a a a different aspect and a different way of dealing with people uh dealing in, in within a group and i think it's incredibly helpful for such a stressy uh undertaking of flying to the mars or flying to the moon or or, or doing even further travel so i, I would very much uh, appreciate if that would happen Thank you. That's actually a perfect segue to the following uh, questions from Barbara, who was, I think, I, I think I read mediation, but I was wondering if you were talking about meditation, Barbara? Yes. Uh, so the question was, would meditation uh, help for the psychology of, uh, of space? So when you talked about stressors and dealing with anxiety and dealing with potential feelings of depression, et cetera, um, I think I'm, I'm going to turn to uh, Professor Romano, uh, Rusomano again. Do you think that um, med meditation techniques could be applied to uh, sp human space programs? No, of course, it is a, it's a very interesting question because it's, um, it is one area that is growing, in fact. Uh, it's not just meditation. It's, um, there are studies and, um, uh, for uh, different groups in the world uh, that want to apply yoga in space. So uh, everything, you know that astronauts have a very busy day. They have, to, uh, mm -hmm. they have to prepare their meals, to clean the spacecraft, to maintain the spacecraft or space station, perform their ex experiments and, uh, uh, and sleep and, uh, <laughs> and also uh, per, uh, conduct many different experiments, but they have moments, you know, like we have normally here on Earth in our days that are moments of relaxation, that they try to socialize or talk to their families or have their moments by, you know, individual moments by themselves. So to, to add, let's say, meditation or, or yoga or all these, uh, 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 let's say, techniques and uh, uh, that can uh, improve the well-being of astronauts, it's, it's really very welcome. And you need to remember that now, uh, there was an astronaut from India in 85, I believe, in the mid 80s. But now uh, the uh, India space program is, is selecting and training their own astronauts and they are gonna launch their own astronauts into space. So it's becoming a country that will be capable of launching humans into space. And uh, you, we know by, by experience and by, you know, by history that uh, India is a country where you know that the uh, yoga or meditation you know, are, are very popular. So things like that will become even more uh, used as, me, uh, uh, as more, let's say, countries and the different cultures join space flight. Uh, that's a very important aspect that I just want to point out that a space flight nowadays is uh, or a human exploration of space is, is changing hands it's going from space governments to the private sector and uh, also it's changing in terms of uh, uh, the countries that dominate uh, space exploration 
uh, we have the traditional ones, but there are some very important countries coming in like China and India and other Japan. So that were not the traditional ones from the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. So it is, it's a huge change now. So women will be more participative, other techniques like meditation, yoga, different cultures, different countries, private sector. So it's a huge change, I believe, that uh, space flight uh, will, um, will have uh, in the next few years. Thank you so much. I think this brings us to our last question, which was asked by Mariana, and she was bringing up already in the chat uh, the question of radiation and the danger of radiation. So during his presentation, Professor Fribe started uh, to address this question, and he also talked about it in, in the chat on the the risk of cancer with radiation. So I will modify a, a tiny bit this question uh, from broad to more specific, with the technology that we have today, do can we go to uh, Mars? Can we stay on the moon uh, without the fear of this uh, of these cancers from radiation? Um, well, th let me let me just go into the into the cell biology and and uh, it, radiation is used to actually treat cancer. You can kill cancer cells, but you can also kill uh, healthy cells. And it's basically has something to do with the mutation cycle of the of the cells. But radiation will go into the DNA and will uh, change and alter DNA and will possibly cause cancer. And it's a, it's a mere statistic. So uh, it, 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 the more you're exposed to radiation. And the longer you're exposed to it, the more likely you will actually develop some form of cancer. So what we need to do is we need to shield uh, these uh, these systems better. Um, and I, I am, from a technical point of view, there's there's several things you can do. You can uh, you can create some form of of a counter field, uh, counter radiation, or maybe a magnetic. Uh, a magnetic field around the ship that basically catches all these uh, radiation. So theoretically, it should work. Um, but uh, whatever you add as as technical devices on on a spaceship is is costs energy, costs uh, weight, is 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 adding weight to it. And so we'll have to see if what the statistic likelihood is of actually getting that. Thank you, Professor Rusomano. Do you have anything to add? No, no it's uh, no, uh, uh, Michael. Thank you very much. Very well uh, said. And uh, uh, as he mentioned, uh, wh when we are in low Earth orbit, we have we are outside our normal atmosphere, you know, the gas you know, composition of our atmosphere. But we still have our magnetosphere protecting us. So the Van Allen uh, uh, belts are still protecting uh, humans against the radiation of deep space. We are more exposed to radiation. Uh, uh, if, uh, even in low Earth orbit, when you know the International Space Station, for example, but um, we are uh, we are going to be even more exposed in, uh, to deep space radiation when you go to the moon or ret return to the moon, or when when they will go to Mars. Uh, there is no magic for, uh, way nowadays to to really protect humans to uh, in this type of uh, trips. That's uh, as we were saying. We have we, there are let's say, futuristic ideas, and, uh, uh, but it's, it is still a huge, huge, huge problem. It's one of the restrictions to, to go to Mars and to live on Mars. I always say that uh, we, we are on Mars. You know, as humans, we sent rovers to Mars. We have now at this precise moment rovers there collecting data. So we know how to get there. There is no mystery. The problem is that we do not know enough in my particular area of, of expertise, which is the space life science or space physiology or medicine. And uh, as I mentioned, the main problems would be uh, uh, radiation, microgravity, and then hypogravity of uh, the moon or Mars, and the psychosocial issues that can uh, happen during a trip or when you are living on this place that are hostile, you are confined, you are uh, distant, uh, in isolation somehow from your uh, family, friends, the professional life, your, you know, the reference here on Earth and so on. I had the pleasure to meet the second man that stepped on the moon, uh, Buzz Aldrin, and I asked him, well, what was the, mo you know, the most important moment of your trip? And then he said, it was when I could uh, delete, you know, from my vision, uh, Earth with my thumb. So I, mm. I, I could... Now, and if you try to do that, I can assure you that 8 billion people on this planet would not be capable <laughs> of delete Earth just with the, your thumb in front of your eye. So this is, a, this is a moment in his life that he 
deleted the entire history of a planet, the entire civilization, not just humans, but everything that happened in 4.5 billion years disappeared. And when you get to Mars one day, as I said in my presentation, you're gonna see mm -hmm. a very tiny pale dot in space. And um, you know, that, that we're gonna, it's gonna be difficult for us to identify where Earth is. And this can be extremely disruptive for your emotions, for your psychology, because we, we believe that this is a huge planet, that everything that we, that that's what gives us life and that's what we live for. But in fact, it is, it's not, it is really a very tiny dot in the universe. Mariana, Thank you. Mariana is making a comment here. If the spacesuits contain a small amount of lead, could it decrease the risk of cancer? I couldn't hear the question, sorry. If the spacesuits contained a small amount of lead, could uh, it decrease the risk of cancer? Mariana asked. I don't know if I, 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 can, I can answer some of that. As a, a, a lead is actually something that is working against gamma rays quite well, but is not working that well against uh, alpha and continuous alpha uh, rays and beta rays. So uh, it, it does, it, it, lead is, doesn't hurt, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a huge burden when you look at the weight and, and, and the unflexibility. You probably need to do more than just a, a couple of millimeters to actually uh, protect yourself. And then it, it gets, gets very difficult. So in general, I would say lead is certainly not hurting, but you cannot get all the, uh, all the rays, all the radiation out the whole spectrum that is actually in space. You can only cover a certain amount of that. Thank you so much. I think we run over time this time. Yes. Thank you so much for everyone uh, one's presentation and presence. Anna, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, hold on. I have a comment to uh, a question to Thais. Thais, is now, according to your presentation, I think it will be, uh, for now, what I saw, it will be difficult to be elderly in outer space. You know? Well, it, it, we don't know much in terms of um, how old people would um, react to space flight. Um, we, have, we had one uh, old person uh, he was 78 years old when he went into space. It was uh, jo um, uh, John Glenn. So he was the first American in 1962 to really orbit the Earth. The first American to go into space was uh, Alan Shepard, uh, basically after uh, Gagarin. But um, uh, jo uh, John Glenn was the first one to really orb orbit the Earth. The Alan Sh Shepard did a suborbital flight. So he was uh, the, the, the hero, you know, this, when he was um, very young at that time. And he, they put him on the back seat for many, many, many years. They, they didn't want to risk to lose the, 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 their you know, first man in space. And uh, so he waited till he was like 77 or 78 years old. And he went to, into this mission in, in the mid 90s, uh, 97 or 98. Uh, in which he was um, uh, he was part of a, a study called the uh, neuro lab in space or neuro mission I don't remember exactly but uh, so it was we, we don't have enough data but we know that um, we we need to have the very we need to be fit and healthy to go into space it's very it's not common to have someone at uh, after seventy that is uh, really fit and healthy uh, so. That's the, the, there is another uh, aspect that uh, many, many uh, symptoms and signs related to microgravity, which is the lack of uh, uh, bone mass and, and um, muscle mass and, and balance and, and many other things are similar to the aging process here on Earth. So it's not the astronauts are aging fast in terms of biologically, they have uh, very similar responses to what happens to someone uh, in old age here on earth. So it is a, uh, it's an interesting question, but I think that as, uh, as we're evolving with science, we need to have data, we need to have, uh, we need to base our uh, definitions of who should fly or not uh, on data. So we need to start sending people and I'm sure that it will happen that have some medical issues that will be careful 
monitored and treated, and we are going to send uh, more women and more um, uh, old people, and maybe one day even children. No, nobody talks about children in space, but one day we are going to evolve to all these um, different, let's say, group of of, of individuals, and uh, data will tell us what is going to be safer or not. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, just looking Thank at. You. Are we missing anything else, Alisa? I know we have not covered uh, astron astronauts' medical and physiological data acquired by digital technology and how we can, uh, the, this data, the privacy, secure, and confidential can be protected. But we have this covered uh, in July under space tourism. Um, so thank you so much for your joining us today. Um, like to. The last thing, we're not, not going to do the quotes today. It's going to take too much of our time just to take a group picture. Whenever you're ready, turn your camera on. Vale. One, two, three. Never works. There you are. One more. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, uh, please send them to us. We can get actually the panel of the that to answer any of the questions you have. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.